What's up guys and welcome back to another edition of Engineers and Friends. My name is Mike and I'd like to wish you all a safe and happy new year and thank God 2020 is finally over. Like, finally over. So today, we're discussing recording an acoustic performance live. If you're an engineer and have been asked to leave the comfort of your studio to record a live performance while instead of a film shoot, or to hi-fi record an artist in concert, or someone just wants you to give them a studio quality live version of their song, this video is for you. We'll cover what gear I use and how to mix and master a final product that sounds something like this. So a few weeks back, I was asked to record one of our artists, Luke James Schaefer, on set of a commercial shoot for the Babe Ruth Museum in Baltimore, Maryland. They have a new exhibit there and needed content to help promote it. I'm going to take you through what process I use to provide a studio level recording from this untreated live environment. Ah, the most unsexy, yet arguably most important step in the whole ball game. Sorry, it's a sports museum. It's so critical because if you do not figure out the minute details of where you'll be recording, you'll never have any success. It'd be like taking a test in school and not studying for it. Yeah, you could do it without prepping, but then don't expect a good grade. For an A at this shoot, see what I did there? I needed to know what instruments were being used, what songs were being performed, were they gonna be loud or intimate? What was the size of the room? How did the room sound when standing in the middle of it? Was it echoey or dead? Were the floors wood, carpeted or tiled? Was there anything to absorb sound that's hung on the walls? What was the HVAC system like? Did we have control over it? These details all sound mundane, but knowing this information can help make or break your final product. There is nothing like being in the middle of a shoot and having a large air conditioner blow the whole thing up. So for step two, I use the information I received from the museum in step one to make good decisions prior to coming on set. The room was big and echoey, but instead of worrying about it and trying to deaden it, I thought I might use that to my advantage to get a larger sound with setting up a stereo match pair of room mics. The HVAC was noisy, but controllable. So I coordinated with the museum to have it switched off when we were recording. And as for the music, I'd only be recording an acoustic guitar and a vocal, so nothing crazy. My plan was to use a large diaphragm condenser, the Warm Audio 87, on the vocals, and another one for the guitar. I'd use a pair of my favorite mics, they're like my favorite ever, the Neumann KM 184s to capture the echoey wooden sound of the room. And to capture all of this, I'd be using a Zoom F6 with its clean preamps to ensure a high quality pre-mix recording. So there wasn't a lot of room to set up. I positioned my mic stands the best that I could. Both WA-87s were set to cardioid. You know that that's the symbol that looks like a heart that means the mic's recording right in front of it only. One was positioned about eight inches from the performer's mouth. The other was about equally distant from the guitar and facing directly at the notch where the guitar's neck meets the body. Note, I did not place the microphone in front of the guitar's sound hole, which would sound way too boomy. And that's all that would be seen on camera, but the real magic would come from the room mics, which would be mixed into taste later. About 10 feet in front of our performer, I set up the Neumanns on a $20 stereo bar I bought from Amazon. If you don't have one of these, I highly recommend you get one. I'll throw a link in the description. All the mics required phantom power, so I made sure they were good to go on the zoom and adjusted the gain to be hitting at minus 12 dB for each track. The WA-87s were recorded in mono and the Neumanns in stereo. We often forget that the magic of most recordings is in the talent that we're actually recording. You can have the greatest gear in the world, but if you are recording a subpar sound source, well, good luck. I'm truly humbled every time I get to work with Luke. Here's a few seconds of his performance. Note the WA-87 mic placement. This is the end product after mixing, but no studio tricks here. This is all him in real time. Oh, honey, show me all your skeletons. Oh, darling, don't be afraid to let me in. We'll stick together now, doesn't matter where we've been. Well, it's all downhill until... And everybody's favorite, mix down. After a breakdown and a number of whiskeys with the talent and crew, I pulled my SD card and uploaded the files into Logic. Here's a quick look into how this project was mixed. 
Okay, so what you're looking at is the actual files that have been dumped into a logic session, and this is the session I use to mix. Um, so let's we'll go through one by one. This is the vocal mic, Warm Audio 87. This is the guitar mic, also Warm Audio 87. And here are my room mics. These are the Neumann KM184s. So let's start with the vocal mic. And whoop, we'll solo that. And one thing I do want to point out is this automation here in the teal. This is actual reverb automation. Take a listen to what it sounds like before and after. All right, yeah, yeah, I got you. Hey, guys, it's Luke James Schaefer. This is my song, Wash, or Down by the Potomac River. Now the reason why I do that is because nobody talks and hear and sounds like they're in a train tunnel unless they're in a train tunnel. It makes sense for the song, but not when he's just speaking on his own. And that's why I think it's critical to automate your reverbs off uh, when someone is speaking. There's no reverb on the rooms. That's why you don't see any um, verb automation there. The yellow here is volume automation. I don't think I needed the room mics for him talking. You can see that kind of turns up the... Um, the room mics when he's performing and then turns them basically off when he's not. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is take you actually into how I mix this. I'm gonna open up um, the vocal mics plugins. So we have an EQ first in our chain, just with a, um, a high pass or low, low cut, whatever you like to call it. And I basically just took this, um, sweep this until it started making a difference in the tone of the, the piece. So let's take a listen. All right, yeah, yeah, I got you. Actually, yeah, do it to... Uh... Let's actually call, move this up a little bit so you can actually just hear. Everything is changing. No, oh, does it feel good? My thoughts are rearranging. Like an... So what you heard there was it started to affect the tonal quality of everything. Um, so when, when I reached around right under 200 here, so then I backed it off until right about at 125, that's where it's not audible and I cut everything below it. And if you notice the sound comes just a hair more under control, um, this 675 Hertz, this little cut here was just an annoyance. There was some sort of frequency that was pinging me. So I moved it down there. I cut some of the higher mids or higher low mids, if you will. Um, just to get rid of a little bit of the, the boomy nature of the mic. And then his vocals really shine at around 2K. So um, at 2140, I just gave it a little bit of a bump. Lastly, or oh, sorry, secondly, is I used uh, Universal Audio's Distressor on this one. That's it off. My thoughts are rearranging. Could I have gone with any other type of compressor? Absolutely. Uh, I picked the distressor because I felt it really was just musically benefiting his voice. It centered it in the mix and just really made it the sound thick and buttery. Okay, so that's the vocal mic. The guitar mic. does not actually have a compressor on it. It has one EQ, it has a second EQ, and it has a little bit of reverb. And this is the, sto uh, st <laughs> the stock logic reverb, say that 10 times fast. All right, so same thing. I'm not gonna take you through uh, what I did with the other one, but I did do another high pass and I increased where I felt the guitar was living pretty strong without interfering with his vocals since um, these were recorded together. So his vocals were sitting over in this range, and now the guitar is going to sit in these low mids, and that's going to really beef up the, rec the recording. Um, I didn't think this quite did it, and so I did add a second EQ. I could have used another stock Logic EQ, but I decided to go with the Fab Filter here, and I cut everything below 100 because I didn't think any information below there was uh, useful. I cut exactly kind of where I cut before with Logic's compressor. Um, this is just a little bit higher. And then I bumped again. Um, now this I bumped up in a little bit into this range just because I wasn't getting the shimmer that I wanted. Uh, but notice these are very small moves. 
And this just kind of gave me a finishing touch over this initial pass. Um, if you watch my other videos, especially like on how to mix or EQ vocals, you like to, you know that I like to use usually two EQs on most instruments. One, my first one being this Logic one is kind of like my broad brush. And then I get a little bit more surgical on my second. Okay, so those are my EQs. And then my favorite guitar reverb is the stock Logic reverb. Um, it's in their, their space reverb. So if you go to, I'll just show you real quick. I'll open up another one. You go to reverb, space designer, stereo. And then I go into my settings, large space, halls, and then guitar large hall. And so that's the same thing as this one. And I'll, I'll play it for you with and without real quick. This is just the guitar mic. So notice the just the small amount of tail that it has. Now keep in mind that I have Valhalla on the uh, his vocal track, and so combined that's going to provide a nice, nice thick reverb um, with some really nice decay. And the reason why I use two different two different reverbs is to help with the imaging of the song. It just makes it sound bigger, wider when things are not happening exactly the same. All right. Lastly, my favorite mics, the Neumanns. So I'll show you what I did here as well. Same principle here, cut out everything below 100. There's nothing useful down there. And the most musical kind of boomy, more boomy sound of the guitar I wanted to get here uh, with the room mics because they are a little bit more trebly oriented. They're further away. So I boosted up really around the, uh, the 230 hertz, 225 hertz range and uh, it has a fairly wide cue. Other than that, didn't do anything EQ wise. And the distressor, I'll show you what that's doing. Everything is changing. Okay, here we go. Now, if you notice, there's a lot more on the compressor uh, that's happening on the gain reduction than um, there is in the original distressor that we used on his voice. Now, I'll show you those two together. So vocal is going to be on the top. Guitar is going to be on the bottom. Check this out. Everything is changing. Oh, does it feel? Now, the reason why I wanted to do that was I wanted to beef the room sounds up just a little bit more and give them that that compressory kind of feel. And that's where the studio um, sound is really going to occur. It's really, really subtle. It's mixed to taste. Notice that it's at um, how low it is compared to my um, my vocal mics and my guitar mic. You can see where its fader is. Now, generally, I like to not have faders down here. I would normally put a gain uh, plug in here and then keep all my faders where their most high resolution is like right around here. But for this, uh, this was kind of a quick pass. I had to get this out and I thought it was sounding good where it was, so I just left it. So that's how I mix the individual tracks. The only thing we haven't discussed and where kind of the magic really is happening now is in the mastering chain, which I, I put right on my two bus here or mix bus. And let's talk about that now. If you notice that my master fader is down, that's just because my screen recordings get like super distorted when it's um, when it's up. So that's just for this video. Okay, so I'll, I'll take you through each plugin as we go. Let's do the first two. All right, so what this is, is this is a tape emulator. It's a Slate Digital tape emulator. And all that's doing is adding a little bit of analog warth, warmth to the sound. It adds just a little bit of edge to um, to the song, a little bit of that analog warmth that takes out some of the digitally uh, or digital nature of the song. Second, I have a console emulator. This is a, another Slate plugin. I highly recommend Slate plugins. They're they're really really good. You can literally lease them from Slate Digital for like thirty dollars a month to get their entire collection, and it's totally worth it. 
Okay, so all this is is basically um, mimicking an SSL. And here you can hear it with it on and off. It's extremely subtle. Here we go. Everything is changing. Oh, does it feel good? So what this plugin really does is it just takes all of those interactions of circuitry and artifacts and gain staging of an SSL and dumps it into a console. It has a number of other ones uh, or different types of consoles. And then you can pick how much you actually want to drive it down here. So those are my first two plugins. So third in my chain is my mastering compressor. This is made by Plugin Alliance. It's the Shadow Hills mastering compressor. Love this thing. I always just put it on mastering medium and uh, sometimes mastering discrete, but it just, check it out what it does. Everything is changing. Oh, does it feel? My thoughts are Sounds great. Next up in the list is just basically a pass through. This is also made by Slate Digital and this is like a mastering uh, mix rack for them, but I just find that audio sounds incredible through it. Everything is changing. No, oh, does it feel? My thoughts are rearranging like I never thought they could. So you can see the electricity it just adds. And notice that I'm not getting any gain reduction on any of these meters. This is just it passing through the plugin. It sounds great. Next up, I'm running a Manly um, EQ. And uh, I actually just went with a preset on this one. It's called Just Great. There's a number of presets here. I, and I scrolled through a bunch of them, but this is Just Great. I end up using on a lot of my um, a lot of my acoustic recordings. So check it out. This is made by Universal Audio. Oh, on and off, sorry. Everything is changing. Oh, does it feel? So a little bit of extra sparkle, a little bit of extra warmth. Next up, um, this is my last EQ, and actually this is a pretty heavy cut for a um, for a mix bus or a two bus. But because we're really only working with one vocal and one guitar, I felt confident in being able to cut three dB out of um, kind of like your mids here. And this this occurred at six hundred and eighty three hertz. And it just got some of uh, some of the ringiness out of the room, and that was more for the room. Same thing up here it was a little harsh, so I just lowered um, some of the higher mids, some of the highs, if you will. And lastly, I ran ozone for a uh, a limiter, and I set it to modern, and then I just got about eight and a half dB worth of limiting here. I always keep my ceiling between minus 0.1 and minus 0.3, depending on you know what mood I'm in but this is what's adding most of the volume. And that's it, that's how I mixed it. Well, thanks for watching guys. Hope you learned something in the tutorial. Can't wait to make more content for you in 2021. Stay safe and hang in there. COVID's almost over. We'll get through it all together and looking forward to seeing you in the next video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. So for song number two here, I am playing Oh Honey. This is from my second EP volume two. Absolutely named. <laughs> Oh, honey, show me all your skeletons Oh, darling, don't be afraid to let me in We'll stick together now, doesn't matter where we've been Well, it's all downhill until it's not but don't let mountains stop you It'll feel so good to reach the top And I'll be standing right beside you Oh honey, hold me close and hold me tight